So what causes people, and I'm talking about saved people, I'm talking about people who belong to Jesus, who are born again, what causes saved people to be despondent so much so that they even come to the place where they want to die, even praying that God would take their life? I've shared these truths a little bit in the past with some of you, but uh, at the encouragement of some, I think it's good to take another look at this. We're, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about four individuals who actually begged God to take their lives, not because they were critically ill or in imminent danger, but because they are utterly discouraged. And by considering them, we just might learn something about ourselves, and we might also be able to deal with some of those causes of discouragement before our situation escalates into desperation, resulting in spiritual disaster. Hopefully in the process, we'll learn something about our great God. That's always one of the objectives for us to get to know God better when we open his word. Now, these four individuals were Old Testament men. They were significant characters in the Bible. They were people who played important roles in God's purposes for his people. They are each mentioned, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. In fact, all four of these men are mentioned by the Lord Jesus himself in the gospel accounts. Though important in God's sovereign plan, every man that we're going to talk about became so despondent that he cried out to God to end his life. So we're going to try to figure out why, and then maybe we can find points of application for us so that we won't end up in the same situation. So today we're going to talk about the prophet Elijah, and his story actually unfolds in 1 Kings chapters 17 through 19. So I, I even thought about this, Eric, we should do a Bible drill with Bibles and electronics and see who gets there first. I'm there. Okay, so um, <laughs> chapter 17, 1 Kings. Um, before we consider him, I, I want to give you a basic outline, uh, a general outline of where I plan to go in this four-part series. Although there are multiple factors involved in the development of, of severe discouragement or even depression, each of these men demonstrates a basic cause that led to their desire to die. It was sort of like a trigger that moved them on. Now, in, in terms of Elijah, we'll look at today, Elijah's response actually was triggered by severe exhaustion. Jacob, the second guy we'll look at next week, Jacob was, was a, um, a guy who was dealing with difficult issues in his family, and actually he came to the place where he began to believe the lie that everything was against him. And as he believed that, he got to the place where he was just ready to give it all up. Now, what he forgot was that for one who belongs to God, everything is not against us. What's the truth? Everything is working for us. So he was believing a lie. So his problem was mental. If we move a little bit further, the, the, in a, after the Mosers are here, the following week, we're going to be um, looking at the man Moses. Moses if you remember, was responsible for leading the people out of Egypt toward the promised land. Now think about this. He's got two and a half million people he's leading, and every one of them has a problem. And all of them think that only Moses can solve his problem. And so they're all coming to Moses day and night, giving them all these grief things, and Moses is trying to sort it out by the, by a, after a while, he is absolutely pulling out his hair, he's blaming God, and he's saying, why have you dumped all these people on me? And he's going crazy with an emotional stress because he can't solve all these problems. And he goes into the place where he finally says, God, just take my life, I've had it. And then the last one was Jonah. Jonah had a spiritual problem. His problem was that he hated the Ninevites. See, the Ninevites, actually Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were a very ruthless people who had given Israel a lot of trouble. They were a very wicked nation. In fact, they were responsible for um, 
ultimately defeating the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jonah was given a message by God. Go tell the people of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, about my mercy and my grace. And Jonah is thinking, are you serious? <laughs> I am not going there because he was afraid that God would show his mercy to them. And he wanted, Jonah was looking for them to be fried by God. I mean, he wanted them destroyed. He wanted them burnt to a crisp. He wanted nothing to do with these people. And so he runs the other way. God brings them back. He goes and he reluctantly preaches. And then they all turn to God. And he sits on the top of a hill overlooking, hoping that maybe God would change his mind and finally destroy him. And he comes to the place where he says, just take my life. I'm done. So Elijah, mental exha I mean, uh, physical exhaustion, that started it all. Moses, believing a lie, mental. I'm sorry, Jacob. Moses, emotional. Jonah, spiritual. Now, that doesn't mean that those are simply, if you have that and you correct that, everything's fine, but it does mean that those can be triggers to move us on into utter discouragement. And so that's where we pick up the idea of Elijah today. Now, for you kids who are filling out your activity sheets, I'm guessing that sometimes you get discouraged. Maybe you didn't get chosen to play a game that you wanted to be involved in. Or maybe you did poorly on a test or a quiz. Or maybe you really had your hopes set on doing something really special and it didn't happen. Maybe you have a pet that ran away or, worse, died. The point is that lots of things happen to us in life that disappoint us and make us discouraged. Today we're going to talk about Elijah. What was Elijah's job? What did he do? See if you can figure that one out. And then after a great victory over a wicked king, who caused Elijah to run away? And then what did that person vow to do to Elijah? And the next question, what did Elijah ask God to do to him? And then finally, one of the reasons for Elijah's depression was that he was utterly what? All right, see how you do. And uh, Mr. John will check you out at the end of the service, right, John? <clears throat> All right. Let's start with talking a little bit about what was going on in Elijah's life and, and, and begin to understand how that impacts or how that connects or how that intersects with us. To begin with, the pressures, we're talking about the pressures that are involved being a servant of God. Anytime we walk with Jesus, anytime we live for Christ, anytime we're involved with honoring God with our lives, there are going to be pressures that come on us all the time. And those pressures come from a variety of sources, not the least of which are circumstances. And for Elijah, the first circumstance, the first issue that he was dealing with, the pressure that he was involved with, was no water. God made clear to the Israelites that if they failed to obey him, that he would shut up the heavens and there would be no rain. Now that's throughout the, the Old Testament law. In fact, if you were to flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, just listen to a couple of verses from chapter 11. Um, Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Take care lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. So that was simply a statement God was saying, if you disobey me, you turn to other gods, I'm going to get your attention, I'm going to discipline you, I'm going to cause it not to rain, and then, hopefully, after you get thirsty enough, you will turn back to me. So that was the idea. That was a long-standing promise from God. So the people of God had actually turned away from the Lord God, and they started worshiping another god. They were worshiping Baal, who was a Canaanite god, and God said then, because of that, that he was going to stop the rain. And so you turn to chapter 17 of 1 Kings, verse 1. It tells us as, uh, that Elijah comes to the king, comes to King Ahab, and he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. 
So the message is given by the prophet to the king that God just shut the heavens. It's not going to rain. And you're going to have to deal with that. To care for the prophet. Now remember, when judgment comes on the nation and you are a prophet in the nation, what happens to you? <laughs> so you're going to get caught up in something of the same situation. So what God did is God took um, Elijah away and he took him to this little brook somewhere out in the, out in the boonies somewhere, out in the country somewhere. He took him out there and he's, he's there and God has a brook there for him to drink from. And so the brook careth and and to supply him with a little bit more in his wonderful grace he sent ravens to bring Elijah bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening how about that I mean carry out service curb service right there in the wilderness and not only did this supply the immediate need but this lesson in God's provision would be needed later there's a problem though when there's a drought and the drought continues on for literally years, what happens to brooks? They dry up. So the brook dried up. So now what's Elijah going to do? Well, he didn't exactly get all frustrated and overwhelmed. He waited for God to direct him to show him where he, need, where he needed to go next. But at least you see the pressure on the prophet from the circumstances, no water. So God moved him along, and he told him to go to a place called Zarephath. But now we've got another problem in that there's no food. And so he goes to this suburb of Sidon, and he meets a previously unknown widow. And when he arrives, he sees this widow gathering sticks, and he says to her that he needs something to drink. And he also says to her that he would like for her to make him a morsel of bread. Then she tells her story. She said, well, here's the way it is. I have just a little bit of flour. I have just a little bit of oil, just enough to make one little cake of food. And then I'm going to give that and split that between my, my one son, my only son, and myself, and then we're going to die. But Elijah said, how about you give me the first bite of that bread? Now, what are you going to do? <laughs> but she did. And Elijah said, because you're going to do that, what he was going to, he said, God is going to allow that oil to keep flowing and that flour to keep coming, and there will always be food for you until God sends rain to the earth. Now, his, uh, Elijah's situation was solved by God's provision through this widow for at least a short time, but the point was that there's more pressure. The circumstances of life keep crowding us. They keep coming on us. All right, so there is no food, no water. There's also a problem with godliness in Israel. It's never easy to be a spokesperson for God, especially when the people to whom we are to speak are in rebellion against God. But it's necessary to call the nation back to God. So here's what was going to happen. There was going to be a meeting with the king, a king who was a follower of Baal, and another god, Asherah, and this king who is this follower of Baal and Asherah is going to have to be brought into a meeting with Elijah in order for Elijah to discuss this and deal with this. Now to give you a little idea of what King Ahab is like, if you turn back to chapter 16, we get a little word from this in verse 30, the very end. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's not exactly what you want on your resume. And as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's who Elijah is dealing with. So you see the pressure, not only no food, no water, no godliness in Israel. And then there's another problem, and that would be with what few people they were that were still following the Lord. There was a courage problem. There was a very frightened 
servant of Ahab, his name was Obadiah, who had already stuck his neck way out by actually hiding a hundred prophets in training to make sure they were going to be okay and kept away from Ahab. See, if Ahab is a follower of Baal and you happen to be a prophet of God or a prophet in training, what's the likelihood of your completing that work? <laughs> Ahab was killing off the prophets of God. And so Obadiah is hiding them. And so Elijah contacts Obadiah and he says, Hey, Obadiah, I want you to arrange a meeting between the king and me, and I'll meet with him, and we'll deal with this situation. Obadiah was very afraid, for one thing, to go to the king, but secondly, Elijah had a way of kind of being directed by God all over the place, and so Obadiah was afraid that I'll set this meeting up, Elijah won't show up, and I'm done. I'm, I'm history. So he was very nervous about that. Elijah absolutely assured him, I'll take care of that, I'll be there, we'll work all that out, and so um, that was the case. Uh, Obadiah did that with great fear and trembling. He tells Ahab, Elijah did show up for the meeting. Elijah set an agenda, challenging the king and his prophets and the Israelites to meet together at Mount Carmel for a grand contest to see who was really the true God. Elijah made it clear that it was not, the, it was not um, him that was all the problem, as Ahab would say, but it was rather the king who was turning the people away from God to false gods. So that's a lot of pressure challenging the king. So you have all these circumstances, no food, no water, no courage, no godliness. And then we have the contest. It's a great, great passage in chapter 18 where Elijah confronts Ahab and then sets up this contest between himself and the prophets of Baal. So there's a contrast between basically Elijah and the prophets. The account's a fascinating one. It's filled with all kinds of drama. Not even, uh, there's, a, there's some, a hint of sarcastic humor in there too, if you want to read about it. Uh, especially when the prophets of Baal are dancing around and cutting themselves and making virtual fools of themselves to try to get their God's attention. And um, Elijah's having some fun with that. Oh, your God may be asleep. Maybe you had to go to the bathroom. That is in the text, by the way. On a journey is how he says it. But anyway, <clears throat> so he's making fun of the gods of Baal. The, all this is going on in this, in this contest. All the prophets of Baal and Asherah had been invited not only to, to make the case that um, Baal was a false god, but, but also to have them present so that the people could see the difference, but also so that the prophets, the false prophets, could be dealt with, namely destroyed. Well, um, keep in mind also that in many ways this looked like the contest was stacked in favor of Baal. Baal, the god of the Sidonians, was a god who was kind of like the god of the heavens. He was, a god of the, he was a god of the lightning and the thunder. Well, if you're the god of lightning, it shouldn't be a real hard problem for you to cause a sacrifice to catch fire, right? Now, every time it would thunder... The people would think Baal was speaking. So it was, it was quite an interesting contest. So this is going on. and then, But really it wasn't a contest at all between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Actually it was a contest between Baal and God. The problem is Baal doesn't exist. And so it really was no contest at all. It was winner take all and God was going to win. It's a great story, but it's not without considerable expenditure of energy on the part of the prophet. In fact, turn to verse 36 of chapter 18. It says, And at that time, or at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O God, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let none of them escape. 
and they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. It was an amazing day. That's how the contest pretty much ended. But there were consequences related to the contest, and that is, that is this. For the, from the king, the king had agreed to the contest, and he, obviously things didn't go so well for him. He had expected a far different outcome, but now he had lost 450 prophets, dead, put to death by Elijah and those who were there on Mount Carmel. Now, there were also 400 prophets of Asherah, we're not sure why they didn't show up, and they were probably glad they didn't, but they were still around, but at least 450 prophets of Baal have now been put to death. So that was the king, and anyway, Ahab goes home, he tells his wife Jezebel all that has happened. Now from the queen, when she hears this, she is, he, she's absolutely blowing up with frustration and anger. So she sends a message to Elijah. So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So it had been a long day. The contest had resulted in great victory, but also tremendous energy had been expended. Following the contest, there was a call for the people to turn to Baal, from Baal to the true God. And because there was repentance, because the judgment against following other gods had now been dealt with, what did God do? He brought rain. And so it began to rain. Elijah ran in front of Ahab's chariot. This is crazy, but so here's Ahab in his chariot. Here's Elijah running in front of him for half a marathon. And he runs all the way back. He gets back to where he's going and, and he gets this message from Jezebel, your toast tomorrow, okay? Now, if you're Elijah and you have just seen the provision of God, what would be your response? I mean, bring it on, but it wasn't. <laughs> Instead, now keep in mind what all Elijah has gone through. He takes off, scared to death, he takes off and runs 150 miles away. And then he gets to Beersheba, he goes a little bit further into the wilderness utterly exhausted, running away from a wicked queen who threatens his life. Those are the pressures that he has dealt with to this point. All of us have pressures in life, whatever they are. I don't think there's any wicked queen after me to get my life, but there might be a lot of other things going on, the pressures of life pulling in. That's what Elijah was dealing with. So he's exhausted, but what are the provisions available to the servant of God? Now we turn to chapter 19. First of all, there's provision for survival. All along, God had provided for Elijah. There had been no water from the brook, and um, meat and bread from ravens was supplied. There, there was lodging and food from the widow of Zarephath. God had orchestrated a meeting with uh, Obadiah and kept Elijah safe through that meeting with King Ahab and gave him victory in the contest. There, there was no reason that the Lord would fail to supply now when the death threat came. God always takes care of his people. He not only makes provision for our survival, but he also makes provision for victory. And that's what you have here. Certainly God had demonstrated his mighty power over false prophets and over impossible circumstances. It was almost as if Elijah was trying to make it hard for God. Remember when he made the, uh, we didn't read it, but he made the altar, and then he probably went to uh, the nearby sea, probably salt water, picked the water up, doused the, um, the, the sacrifice, the altar in water, dug a trench around it, water filled up that. When God brought fire, he burned up everything. It's amazing. All of that. Because the people repented, the judgment came to an end. The fresh rains from heaven began to fall. Victory was secured in the Lord for not only Elijah, but for the nation of Israel. How great God is to always keep his word and to always accomplish his will. He always does. But how often we focus on something outside of that. Instead of looking at the size of our God, what do we look at? The bigness of our problem. So... 
Elijah, after going through all of these things and seeing all that had happened and how God had supplied, instead of saying, I trust you to deal with this wicked queen, he runs away, cowering from her, forgetting about all the supply of God. Wicked queen, 450 prophets of Baal. Hmm, you know. Dealt with them, not with her. Very interesting. Have we sometimes, uh, I think it was uh, one of the Bible translators of, I forget now, uh, Phillips or somebody who used to say that, wrote a book, said, your God is too small. <laughs> He's not, but maybe our view of him is. And then there was a provision of testimony. Elijah had stood against a hostile crowd. He declared the greatness of God. He called the people, don't vacillate between two opinions. And as the fire consumes the sacrifice, the people cry out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. A great victory. One of the things I'm learning is that when we have great victories, we are probably the most vulnerable. What do you do when you're successful? What do you do when God provides? We kind of let down our guard. And when we do, we are ripe for defeat. And I think that's part of what happened to Elijah. But let's take a look at the potential for failure as a servant of God. The very first thing that I was suggesting very early on in this is the whole issue of inadequate rest and nourishment. Vance Havner, an old preacher of another generation, used to say, if you do not come apart to rest, you will come apart. <laughs> Sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is to eat a good meal and get some needed sleep. Chapter 19 opens, Elijah received the threat in great fear he ran for his life. It was after he ran beyond Beersheba into the wilderness that he finally said, It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And when he says that, his father's, he's talking about those dead relatives, and he's saying, I'm no better than them, just take my life, I'm done with this, I, I'm, I'm done. Now think about this for a minute. Elijah has somebody who wants him dead, so he runs away, and he says, God, just take my life. Could have spared a lot of trouble. Just let, let Jezebel kill him if that's really what he wanted. But also, this is interesting. I was thinking about this a couple days ago. This is one guy who's crying out to God to take his life. When did Elijah actually die? Think about it. He never did. He's the guy that God took up into heaven, remember? Chariot came, picked him up, took him up. So the guy who's crying out saying, God, please take my life. God didn't answer that. In fact, he never died. But all through this, um, God took care of Elijah. Did Elijah need a lecture? Probably. Did God discipline him? Surely deserved, but none of that happened. Instead, God gave him sleep. And on two occasions, in chapter 19 now, verses 5 to 7, he actually sustained him by sending an angel to bring him food and water. Why? Because that's what Elijah needed. And it was pretty effective because from the strength of that, he went another 40 days. So it's a very interesting how God's looking at Elijah. Elijah's overwhelmed with, with doubt. He's overwhelmed with discouragement. He is, he is to the place where he wants to die. And instead of God lecturing him or, or doing something like that, he brings him food and water and lets him rest and wakes him up a couple of times after he sleeps. I find that interesting. That should have taken care of the problem, you would think, if that was the cause but if the cause for discouragement is physical, once the issue uh, is solved, it may not completely go away because during the time when we get discouraged, overwhelmed, maybe because of exhaustion, we tend to pick up other issues along the way. And that's what happened. Elijah had regained his strength, but he lost his perspective. He was still running, still hiding. He found a cave, and he settled in to sulk. And I love the, the question that the Lord asked Elijah. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> and he asked him that twice. 
And the response to the question revealed more of the problem. While exhausted, this happened. As he was tired and overwhelmed, he then began to overestimate his significance. When we're discouraged, everything is about us. Listen to Elijah's defense, chapter 19. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You see a problem with that? He's looking at himself, I'm the only guy left, the only one. Now, remember earlier, there were a hundred prophets in hiding, and God let him know that there were a whole lot more that had never bowed the knee to Baal. But when we get overwhelmed with discouragement, everything's about us. It's right there. And that's what Elijah was dealing with. So the Lord actually gave a series of commands to Elijah. And then he um, actually then gave a, uh, a correction to Elijah's understanding about his, about his significance. He said, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I would just say this, that when we get overwhelmed and we start thinking about us and all we can see is us, we're never quite as important or alone or, or as irreplaceable as we might think. So there was an overestimation of significance, but there was also an underestimation of the potential for power and victory. Because of Elijah's overestimation of himself, God assigned another to take his place. And while it's true that Elijah remained a great prophet in the eyes of the people, and he is honored by God in the Bible, I really think that he cut his ministry short and certainly decreased the impact he could have had on the people of God because he failed to trust in the Lord. He hung on to those issues even after being called out by God to trust God. So what started out as utter exhaustion developed into depression, turned into muffled ministry, resulting in muted testimony concerning the wonder and glory of God. There are always pressures in life and ministry that wear us down. Some of you walk in here on a Sunday morning and you are absolutely overwhelmed with exhaustion. If you fall asleep during my sermon, I won't even wake you up, all right, because maybe that's what you really need. Sometimes all those pressures and challenges come to us. But when we're physically weary, we can lose our perspective. And when we lose our perspective, we begin to look inward. And the more we look inward, the more self-centered and blind we become. And we justify our responses and we blame those around us. And that leads to spiritual defeat. And when, when we should be strong in the Lord, we become cowards, hiding, pouting, and praying, Woe is me, just take my life. That's a pathetic scene for the child of God that perhaps could have been avoided early on if we would have simply gotten a little rest and nourishment. Now, I'm not saying to you, go home, eat a good lunch, take an afternoon nap, and all your problems will be solved, if only it were that simple. But I am trying to warn us that life's pressures are real and we need provision from the Lord, and sometimes that means we have to come apart to rest for a while. Elijah lost sight of that and it cost him. And it cost the people of Israel. God had another servant ready to carry out the task, and he always does. Because he always accomplishes his will. But I believe Elijah could have accomplished more for the glory of God. But he didn't end his life well. So, what is there here for us? It starts with our faith in the Lord, trusting him for all we need. It continues with our obedience to him, recognizing his supremacy in all things. We are not sufficient in ourselves to win all the battles and meet all the needs, but we can do the will of God for the glory of God all the time. And our responsibility is to live for him. He will decide when it is time for our departure from this earth. He who restores our souls is also able to refresh our bodies and renew our strength that we may run and not be weary and we may walk and not faint. That's his promise. And the question is, can we trust him to supply? So if you know Jesus, 
He is able to give you strength and help, and if, if you need rest, get it. If you need better nourishment, get it. And, and then keep trusting him, and as the pressures come, handle those. If it gets away from you and you start to slide into self-absorption and then begin to doubt God and then almost turning away from God, that's not a good thing. It's interesting in that whole little scheme of things, what happens is physical can morph into mental, can move into emotional, can ultimately become a spiritual problem. You don't want that. Let's shut it off and then go back and repair the damage and keep trusting him and watch him work. He is an amazing God. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your people here. All of us um, have bouts with discouragement. We're overwhelmed by life. Sometimes the pressures and challenges are more than we can handle, and that's by design, I think, by you, because we're not supposed to handle them all. We're supposed to trust you in them. And when these problems come and difficulties come, help us not to be overwhelmed by that. Teach us how to trust you, how to walk with you, how to live for you, how to honor you with our lives. I pray that you'll help all of us because from time to time we may come to the place where we are just had it, we can't deal with it anymore, and we may cry out to you to do something about it in terms of just taking us from the scene. May you spare us from that. May you remind us that you have brought us into a relationship with yourself and you've given us a life to live and we have responsibilities until you call us home and not before that we are to live for you and glorify your name regardless of the pressures. Help us to learn to walk with you. Thank you for being a God who, that we can trust, a God who is trustworthy and a God who always meets our needs, always supplies all we need as we look to him for that. I pray you'll help each one of us to deal with those issues in Jesus' name.